And now we begin to wonder why are we suffering so much defeat when we're spending all this time with God. Yeah, we're praying and we're praying and we're seeking God, but we are not hearing from God. And we go into these battles well-intended, feeling that we're well-equipped because we've heard the prosperity message. We've heard the message of the gospel of grace. We've heard the word of faith that all we do is profess this and God is obligated to perform the very thing that I profess because my faith is solid in who He is. And we, we go out with well intentions and, and, and wind up getting whipped and sent home. In this passage, there is getting ready to be a civil war that's, that's going to happen. And it's not a question of the problem that, that arises that it needs to be dealt with, but the question will be, will the tribe of Benjamin, because that's the one that's, that, that, that's in trouble here, will they do what's right? If they don't, then there has to be war. And this, we, we, we go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22, and that gives the Israelites what they must do in response to what has just happened. And in this, and, and I'm just going to give you just a little synopsis, and, and, and I'll, I'll go over all this, but, but I want you to have this in your mind before I get there. In this, what happens is, a, 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 a Levite, his concubine, has been, she has been killed, no doubt. She's been raped, no, no doubt what all has happened to her. And because of this, the nation of Israel, and, and to, to, in case you don't understand, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. So one of the sons being Benjamin, these are called the 12 tribes of Jacob or the 12 tribes of Israel. One of the sons is responsible to turn these men over so that they can deal with this sin, and it's going to be death to the parties involved. And what happens, Benjamin refuses, the tribe of Benjamin refuses to hand these men over, so there has to be consequences. And what you find is the nation of Israel, they seek God on some, some areas. First of all, who should be the tribe, the first tribe to go and to fight against the tribe of Benjamin. And the Lord tells them, Judah. And they respond accordingly. So, and, and they inquire of the Lord, so they, they know that this is what God has, has consented and, and, and condoned this war. So they go out to fight against Benjamin. Now Benjamin has 700 left-handed Warriors, and, and and they take the, the I research this. So they take that sling, and they say this sling that they were very accurate at two hundred plus yards, and it would reach speeds of like a hundred, hundred and twenty-five miles an hour, and and the area where they were going to be fighting was more of a defensive posture. In other words, the ones defending basically had the advantage rather than the ones attacking. But Israel. The other 11 tribes have sought God. God has told them what to do. So they go fight against Benjamin. And what happens? 22,000 are killed. And they come back. So they seek God again. And they go out and fight. And 18,000 are killed and they come back. Till finally they go the third time. So what comes out in this, and by the way, I was sent this, sent this study, uh, uh, I guess they just started it, 
about two months ago. So I've been looking at it off and on for two or three months and decided I would try to present it as a sermon. be better taught in a, in a more informal setting like Sunday school, but it is what it is. So here we go, because our thinking is, I have sought God, I have heard from God, I go do what God says, and I suffer defeat. What's going on with this? What's, I, I'm going to tell you, uh, the Christians today, we would be in an uproar with God. So, so maybe I misunderstood, so I go again, and again I consider, and I ask God, and He says, go get them. And they get whipped again. So it demands a little more attention from us, and something we need to find something that we can pull out of this Scripture to help us, because I will tell you, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to agree with it, and I know Christians have trouble with truth. We really do. We have trouble with, with really what's happening. We have trouble with defeat in our lives because somehow or another we associate that with that we are completely out of the will of God or we're, we're, we've got something terrible going on in our life, and that may be the case, but, but we just don't associate ourselves with, with not being in the will of God. And we're suffering defeat after defeat after defeat. The body of Christ is, is, is suffering defeat on every hand. So we must find what's going wrong because I'm going to tell you, we can no longer continue walking the paths that we've been walking for however many years now. We must, we must learn and figure out what it is that we are missing in the Word of God rather than we have decided we will just be okay and comfortable with all the defeats because at the end of the day, we win and we go to heaven. Is that not what we say? You know, we may lose this war, but we, or this battle, but we win the war. At the end of the day, we're going to go to heaven. Well, I'm here to tell you that is that that that's what's got us into a lot of our in, into a lot of the mess we're in. It's true, but we need to, we need to desire the victories. So, chapter twenty in the book of Judges. And I'm going to read you the twenty-eight verses. You have to bear with me. I study it all the time in King James, and now I'm reading it in New King James. So uh, sometimes it's just a little different. So all the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, as well as gathered uh, together, or as well as from the land of Gilead, and the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. Then the children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, My concubine and I went to uh, Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me, but instead they ravished my concubine so that she died. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, sent her throughout the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness in the outrage in Israel. Look, all of you are the children of Israel. Give your advice and counsel here and now. So all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go into his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is a thing which we will do in Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. We will take ten men out of every hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand, and a thousand out of every ten thousand, to make provisions of the people, that when they came to Gibeah in Benjamin, that they may repay all the vileness that they have done in Israel." So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united as one man. Then the tribes of Israel sent men throughout the, all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now therefore deliver up the men and the perverted men who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove the, remove the evil from Israel." 
But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. And from their cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who numbered 700 select men. Among all these people were 700 men select who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Now besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. Then the children of Israel rose and went to the house of God to inquire of God. And they said, which of us shall go up first to battle the children of Benjamin? The Lord said, Judah first. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and capped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And all the house of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against them at Gibeah. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. And the people, that is, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. Then the children of Israel went up and went before the Lord until evening and then counseled the Lord again, saying, Shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day, and Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah on the second day and cut down the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword." Then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, the ark of the covenant of God, it was there in those days, and Phinehas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Hmm. We have a problem going on. This does not match up with our theology at all. At all. So what is it in this? What, what is taking place that, that God would tell them to go, to even tell who to go, and yet they suffer defeat? So, first of all, I want to get some things cleared up that we cannot expect the presence of God to be with us until we seek God by humbling ourselves before Him. And I'm going to tell you, that takes on a greater meaning than what you're even thinking. I don't even know if we understand what humbling ourselves before Him. And, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but many times we are, we are, we are seeking God for answers or, or uh, 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 instructions, and we have not even humbled ourselves before Him. So therefore, we are approaching the most holy God, the most righteous God, in a manner that is so unworthy. And we don't give it a second thought. But not only that, I want you to understand that God is not obligated to prosper you and I. He's not obligated to me. He's not obligated to you. He is not obligated to prosper any one of us. We find throughout history, even during this time, no doubt, but definitely today, that men are often so confident that God owes us some type of favor, His favor, because Maybe we think the cause we are working for is a good cause. Now, in the early service, I used the cause of, uh, of, of standing for life. 
And there, there's probably not a greater cause for us to stand for. And it's something that we need to do. But if we're not very careful, we think because we are standing for such a good cause, that God has to grant favor simply because of the good work that we think that we may or may not be doing. And this is not true. We think that it's needless to humble ourselves before God in penance or repentance because we are doing something good. We're coming to church. We're, we're, we're teaching our lessons. We're giving in offerings. We're, so God kind of owes us. Listen, we're not in a contract with God. You, 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 we, we, are, we are to pay respect and humble ourselves before God regardless of what's going on in our life. Period. So we see a Levite here who, who comes and he gives this straightforward account of what has happened and, 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 and he is going before the, the nation of Israel, the other eleven tribes, and he's saying, now what are you going to do? And what's happened, we, we see, and if you read in verse 21, or maybe verse 8, maybe verse chapter, or chapter 21, verse 1, we, we can begin to read and understand in this, but by this, by this oath that was made that the people uh, have passed so easy, they've, they've, they've passed by so easy of the toleration of their evil that they now demand judgment from God over what just happened. In other words, it's like you and I praying that God deal with these thugs. You need to take them out, God. And all along, we have just tolerated evil in this country so easily without, without even hardly saying a word. Amen anyway. This is what's going on. The, the, so now you've got the nation of Israel because now I open up, well, they don't have the Bible, but you go to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22, and it tells you if this evil has happened, this is what you must do. So all this evil has been happening, but now this one instant comes up and they demand judgment from God on the party. Now the Bible says that something must happen, but they are, they're not even given consideration for their lack of, of involvement or their lack of stand. Where was the outcry when all of this other evil was taking place? Oh my. They decided that God should direct this course of the battle, yes. But they also kept their army positioned and the provisions of the army through their human efforts there at the forefront. In other words, uh, folks, l l let, me, let me say it like I feel it today. We are going to go to war with China. It may be a proxy war through North Korea, but there's going to be a war. I'm absolutely confident. Our president doesn't get up and make all these statements, and he's blaming China, and, and we're already seeing some, some conflict there in, in, in the China Sea over, over some islands. There, there is, there's going to be a war if, I, if, if India and China don't go to war first. And because of our military strength, because of our, our, our the, the technology, we, we spend seven, eight hundred billion dollars a year, three, four times more than probably China will spend. And because of our, our military superiority, yeah, we may seek God for help, but we are completely relying upon the strength of our military. This is what's happening here. Remember, Benjamin has 700 select men, 26,000 people. Israel has 400,000 men of war. So they're still, they're still trusting 
into their, 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 their numbers and their superiority over their brother tribe, Benjamin. And that's a problem. That's a problem when it comes to the things of God. When, when there's been a nationwide toleration of evil, that now it, 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 it's not this one instance with this, this Levite and this concubine, but this nationwide tolerance of evil has now led them to a nation at the brink of civil war. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, that's not such a far-fetched thought even in America today. As, as, as you start seeing, I, I'm confident that, that the Bible Belt would really, we would really make a strong stand for our religious liberties. But, but I don't know how well that would be accepted in, in many other states. Thank God for Matt Staver. Thank God for Liberty Council. Thank God for Rick Green and some pastors that went to Chicago this past weekend. Because I'm going to tell you, if, if they'd already, the, the, the officials had already made the statements, if these churches do not comply, we're going to bulldoze them to the ground. That's what they said in America. How do you not think this is going to not going to happen at some point in time? They're already mouthing it out loud. It's just a matter of time before they start doing some of these. We've already seen churches being shot up, parking lots being uh, 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 torn up and, and things of this nature because that the church is not complying with what the people think that they should comply with. And what's going to happen if we don't get a hold of this, this evil is going to come against us and immediately we're going to, we're going to demand judgment on these people from God, and God is sitting there saying, what about all this evil that's led us up to this point? Where were the cries then? See, the tribe of Benjamin is faced with the difficult choice. They either join in this moral outrage of a nation, or they stand by their fellow Tribesmen. So before the we, we see before the, even the tribes of Israel entered upon the war, they sent select men to Gibeah, where the tribe of Benjamin, they, to the area, and they said, "Give us the men. Give us these men that did this, so that we may put them to death." Of course, they didn't do it. So now, war was evident. So they, now they sought God on what they should do. And who should go? And God said, we can read this in the passage, God appointed the tribe of Judah. You can read this in, in the book of Judges. You can read in Judges 1. You can read this uh, uh, in Judges 1, verse 1, and Judges 1, verse 2. We also understand that the Ark of the Covenant is no longer in Shiloh. That is too far away. But now the Ark of the Covenant has been brought to Bethel. And this man by the name of Phineas, who is the, the son and grandson of, 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 of people like Aaron, he's, he's the high priest, he now has inquired of the Lord. So now you've got the greatest spiritual leader in Israel inquiring of the Lord. And so now, Israel feels equipped. I'm going to tell you something. That little voice in your head, or the, 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 the chill bumps up your spine, or the hair raising on your arms, the feeling that you may have, that feeling will lie to you and get you into a world of trouble. Because they felt ready, they felt adequate. They've heard from God. The high priest has sought God. Folks, I'm here to tell you, 
if we're not careful, see, we have been so we have been so indoctrinated with certain traditions in certain ways, we don't even consider is there something else that we need to stop, slow down, clear our mind, and allow God to really speak to us and get the full message. Many times we probably get part of a message and we just take off and then wonder why it failed. So they failed equipped, and so they go out against Benjamin. And the Benjamites came out and destroyed 22,000. Despite this terrible overthrow, mistake number two, the people strengthened themselves, prepared again for battle, sought God again, and I, I'll reiterate some of this time and time again, because by Thursday you only retain 5%, and I want to make sure you retain the right 5%. They sought God, and then, in my opinion, they made a terrible mistake. They went to the same place with the same plan. Not even considering what had just happened. They went to the same place with the same plan. They done it the same way. And again, again, we, we see Phineas saying, Shall I draw near to war with the, ch the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the answer was, Advance against him. So on this second attempt, whether it's the next day or whatever, but the second attempt, the Benjamites brought 18,000 of them to the ground. In other words, they killed 18 more thousand. I'm going to give some credit here to the Israelites. It only took twice. How many of us have been walking around this problem for years of defeat? Because we, we've heard the message and the advice, you just need to pray through. What does that even mean? I was listening to, and, and I know what they're saying, but, but I was listening to a guy preach yesterday, and he said, you need to pray until you feel the victory. And we pray until we feel the victory and get up and are defeated again. So here we are. Twice they've sought God. Twice they've walked in defeat. After this second terrible overthrow, the Bible says the children of Israel, in other words, it's saying all the people, the rest of the people. In other words, what they're saying is those members of the congregation who are not capable of bearing arms, old men, old women, came to Bethel to voice, to voice their concerns to God. What it means today is it's high time that the congregation gets involved. We can no longer excuse why we don't do it. Because I, heard, I did hear, I did hear something that I, I, I really think I agree with, a statement that made us God will always listen to reason, but He will not listen to excuse. I kind of like that. So there, there's no excuse. It's, it, it can't be, well, I'm not this or I'm not that. There's no excuse. We see here, we see this being played out. The Lord in all His wisdom has shown us what, how even when they sought Him, they still went in defeat. So here, the rest of the people, 
They came to voice their misfortune to the Lord and to find His favor once again by doing what? By fasting and offering sacrifices. Because what, what, what they came to the realization is what we need to do. They discovered, or at least began to realize, that something had to be wrong. Something was missing because they've had two defeats. I don't know how many defeats we've had, but we need to stop right now and say, what is wrong? It's not anything wrong with God. What is going on here? Why are we suffering all of these defeats? Was it sin? Well, I'm sure parts of it is. But I will tell you their sin of going to war was not it, because that was not a sin. The law in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and they referred to this in verse 13, required them to do the very thing that they were doing. But, in the state of mind in which they attempted this war is where we find their problem. They became, they were strong and self-sufficient, strong in in their self-consciousness, maybe is a better word, their great confidence in their own might and their own power, which in turn is keeping them from seeking God on how to win the war. See, if we're already confident that we have everything we need, we don't seek God on how. We just seek God on be with us while we go. Well, I will tell you in these last three or four months that there, there's a message that the Lord has given me that I will not ever forget. And, and it's completely just tearing my life up right now, yet, and a few more things, because the, the Lord is, has, has constantly reminded me the message has not changed, but the method has changed. And we can either change with the method, or we will continue going down the path that we've been going for years, and we're going to suffer even greater defeats. And I'm here to tell you, we're beginning to see an onslaught against the Christians and against the church that anything less than the power of God working in our life is not going to grant us any victory or any relief at all. I'm truly confident of this. And I think the Lord loves us enough He's trying to prepare us and get us ready. I thought it was quite amazing that the Bible tells us that they inquired of God, and the word God here, they use is Elohim. This wasn't some false, strange God. This was Elohim that they had consulted. But they consulted on who should open the conflict... They neglected to humble themselves before God on their on their own weakness, even their own sinfulness, but also the grief of the moral condition of their brother, the Benjamite tribe. And that really began to speak to me. Because here we are, and, and, and we'll just take this abortion issue, and we think about uh, someone like Kermit Gosnett, or Gosnell, rather. And, and, and boy, we just, we just don't show no love at all. And, I, and, and trust me, I'm not saying that we need to be doormats and we need to, we, 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 we need to be these flower children that's out in, the, out in the streets in the airport handing out flowers. And, and, and no, trust me, if you're going to have to do that, I'm out of this. Uh, that, that's just not going to work for me. I don't hand out flowers and I don't wear pink. So that's just not going to, that's not going to work for me at all. So, so it can't mean that. But, but, but what it does mean is where is the grief that we have over the people like the pro-choice people of the moral condition they are in? Where is the brokenness? Where, where, Where is the brokenness for our brother 
citizens that's out here just destroying property, setting fires, and, and all their concern is, is just to create a, a scene and to cause evil and destruction. Yeah, these people need to be dealt with and they need to go to jail. But, but where is the love and the concern over these people that are indulging in this that they're going to spend eternity in hell? Now, don't ask me how we minister to those people because I don't think that you can. I think the only thing at this point you're going to be able to do is pray for them because I promise you, if you enter that crowd to try to work with them and pray for them and straighten them out, they'll probably kill you. But it's not so much about what we should be doing. It's it's all about where is our heart in all of this. I mean, here we are. Christian people, and, and we hate this, 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 this homosexuality, and we hate this, this same-sex marriage and all of this stuff. And, and what, what, what do we find a lot of Christians doing? Calling them vulgar names. We, we're, we're calling them names that I would smack my kids in the mouth for say. But not only that, we're, we're, we are Christians where we have a president that stands up and says something like, if governors don't do what they're supposed to do, I'm going to overpower them. And, I'm going to, and we've got Christians backing and supporting this. We're uh, Christians backing and supporting something that goes totally against the U.S. Constitution simply because it's Donald Trump and we're such pro-Donald Trump people. See how messed up we are. And now we begin to wonder why are we suffering so much defeat when we're spending all this time with God. Yeah, we're praying and we're praying and we're seeking God, but we are not hearing from God. And we go into these battles well-intended, feeling that we're well-equipped. Because we've heard the prosperity message. We've heard the message of the gospel of grace. We've heard the word of faith that all we do is profess this and God is obligated to perform the very thing that I profess because my faith is solid in who He is. And we we go out with well intentions and, and, and wind up getting whipped and sent home. See, many times uh, here, they resolved that their resolve was in their continuance of the war, the conscience of their superior power and their numbers. Our confidence is is being placed in a man made doctrine that tickles our ears and would never consider that I just heard from God, but I'm going to lose anyway. Well, that's just happened. Now, if you want to search, and you won't have to search very far, you'll find commentaries that will tell you it's because they didn't get uh, specific with God. Okay, that, that's foolishness. So I need, to, I need to name every specific thing with God for anything. If, 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 if I'm having trouble with my finances, then I need to say, okay, Lord, I need $15 for my electric bill. I need $15 for my water bill. I need $200 for my direct TV bill. I'm glad you were listening. Because I don't know who's got a $15 electric bill, but I will say this. This church last month, this electric bill in this building was $62. Man, I, Trish, I shouted. If anybody that knows me, my pet peeve is the air. You don't touch the air. You don't turn things on. If you turn it on, you better turn it off because I want to see how low I can get. Our, our electric bill over there at the fellowship hall was $47. So I just danced the gig again. You know what I did? Took all that money we saved and pushed it right into the missions. Because that money had already been appropriated. I didn't need anybody's approval. They would have never known if I hadn't have just told you.
God said, go against them. The people came. Let me tell you about this, this sacrifice. Because I need, I need to wind this thing up. There was two sacrifices that were offered. Burnt offerings and a peace offering. Two classes here. These showed both their repentance and their desire for reconciliation which would restore communion with God. That's why these two sacrifices were offered. Only after the events these that all the people got involved. The ones not able to go and actually fight the battle, everybody got involved. They offered a time of fasting and these two sacrifices. God knew now the intent of the heart. And now when they acquired of the Lord whether they should continue the war, they received this reply, You go up against Benjamin, for tomorrow I will give them to your hand. For the first time, God now assured them the victory. And it was because many times there are very hard lessons for God's people to learn. And this is one of them. So, what lessons can we learn? I'm just going to briefly just mention four. There's, I'm, I'm sure there's a handful. First of all, I want you to realize there is consequences from sin even after repentance. You might think, Pastor, that's not true. Yes, it is. This nation, and we live in this nation, we are going to suffer the consequences and are suffering the consequences because of all the evil and all of this sin that has been happening, all this evil that's happening has been so easily tolerated by the people of God. We are going to suffer the consequences regardless of repenting for it. There's consequences that's going to have to be that's going to happen. The second lesson is even though we suffer defeat, we do not give up. And we sure stop blaming God. Third, pay a close attention. And maybe if we pay close attention, God is showing us how to win victories by allowing us to be defeated. Simply because if the victory was always given the way we've always done things, doing the status quo or the way it's always been done would never, would never even cause us to search God to find out what the problem would be. So, in the defeats, God is showing us the path to victory if we're smart people. And number four, and this one has hit me really hard over the last few months, is that we must start looking at new ways to accomplish the goal of getting the message out. It may mean doing something that seems to be the opposite of what we think or what we think we should do or how we think we should do it. On the second go around, they went to the same place and they did the same thing. They approached God the same way. And the results were the same. Defeat. Of 
Folks, we must, uh, we are creatures that fight change on every hand, but I'm promising you, change will have to happen. It's going to have to happen on personal levels, it's going to have to happen on corporal levels. I'm, I'm so confident. If we continue doing the same things over and over and over, we, are, we can expect nothing but the same results. And I will tell you, it, 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 it's always been my life since I've been a Christian. It seems like the Lord has always asked me to do something that is so controversial to, to the body of Christ. Whether it's been talking about the political arena from the pulpit, whether it's talking about Common Core, whether it's, whether it's bringing in so many things that's not the normal message you hear from the pulpit, and it always seems by the time I, 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 I get you to understand where I'm coming from, that the Lord begins to deal with me on another area that's going to require, that's going to require us to really be on our face before God. The thing about it is with change, not every time and not everything needs to be changed. That's where first and foremost we must have a working knowledge of the Word of God to be able to go back and reference the Word of God on if this is what we should do or should not do. And when the Bible is not clear on this, then we must seek counsel with some good godly people that you know will help you pray before we make changes that need to be made. But changes are coming. I don't know what kind of changes. I will say this to you. True Christianity today is going to have to appear as radical. 